So, this is his residence. It's been a year since we met. Now it's time to send you a present. Ready, Jirachi? Yep. Good. Huh? Where am I? Hi, I'm Jirachi. No shit. But what are you doing here? Simple. I came here to grant your wish. Except I don't have one. I know. Second and all that. But I can give you a look into a wish. What do you mean? As a psychic type, I can see into your memories. And there is the one event that I could easily reverse. Your parents' divorce. No. I moved past that point. It doesn't affect me anymore. I don't care. You're gonna see a reality where this never happened, and you're gonna like it. Where are we? Why did I ask that? This is your place. Well, in this reality, anyways. So I take it Artemis and Vincent bought it? Nope. Their son did, a.k.a. you. You moved out when you were 19 thanks to your job as an agent, and you backed off this place in Nova Scotia. It looks more pixelated than Nova Scotia. Hey, shut up. Whatever. This is seriously boring me. Oh, really now? How bored are you? Bored enough that I can literally do a review in my sleep. Okay, then. There's the patio for us in this reality. Go nuts! So, this movie... Pokemon Jirachi Wishmaker was released in America in 2004 and was the first movie to feature the cast of the Gen 3 anime. Like I said in the last review, Pokemon Heroes was the last movie to feature Ash, Misty, and Brock as the main characters of these films until Mastermind and Mirage Pokemon. But they didn't stop making movies, nor did they stop making episodes, because once Johto ended, we got the Generation 3 anime. So instead of Ash, Brock, and Misty going through the Hoenn region, we have Ash, Brock, and two new characters, May and Max. May is based off the female character from the Gen 3 games, and Max was created strictly for the show. To sum them up, May wanted to be a Pokemon trainer, but then became a coordinator, basically someone involved in contests, and acts like a big sister to Max. Max is an annoying character who basically tells the group where to go. Yeah, I don't like this guy. I got the reason for his creation, but I was really happy to see him gone once Generation 3 came to an end. So does this film kick off the Gen 3 movie tetralogy with a bang? Let's find out. Our film begins with a World of Pokemon recap, except unlike last time, they don't recycle it from the previous film. No, no. Instead, they use new footage while also showing clips that reference the films that came before it. There's Mewtwo, Lugia, Entei, Celebi and the Terrible CGI, Latios and Latias, wait, aren't you dead? The film then goes on to say that Team Magma exists, but despite the potential of an entire team as the villains of this picture, the film decides to have the main villain be a guy who was kicked out of the team. Great. Speaking of, this guy is Butler, a magician, and the person next to him is his assistant slash possible girlfriend, Diane. So, we've gone from jewel thieves to magicians. You know, I'm starting to see why a lot of the newer films said the bad guys be Pokemon, because, yeah, this is kind of stupid. I mean, what's next? A villain that's also a pirate? So Butler blows up a rock, and he finds a purple crystal inside it. Sweet! Now he can complete his rock collection. We then cut over to Ash's group, and it only took two minutes this time. And we got some vague foreshadowing about wishes. Hold up. Are you seriously stopping me in the middle of my review? Yes. Do you hear that? Uh, now that you mention it, yeah. It's coming from down below. Let's take a listen. Alright, good job, guys. That was a great unison attack. But you guys look tired, so go on, get some shade. I'll go and fetch you something. You deserve to be rewarded, after all. That's me? You seem surprised. Since your parents didn't split up, you lived a much happier life and trained not only your mind, but also your body. But what about the others? What about Mark? What about Fawn? What about Shiny? They're all still friends with David. Their bodies didn't change in this reality. They're still strong. But you may have noticed this kitty in that group. Yeah, I think I know where you're going with this. See? You got a good life in this reality. And a happy ending with the girl you love. Look, no one cares. They really don't. So can we get back to the review now? Okay, thanks, bye. So we're with Ash's group, they're looking for a festival. Because you see, this festival is supposed to celebrate the coming of the Millennium Comet, a celestial body that stays in the sky for seven days and only appears every thousand years. Oh, so Ash won't miss much if he doesn't see it this time. He's just gotta wait till Gen 20. Yet it'll still be 10. But I guess the guys in charge of the festival knew Ash was coming and decided to stay home because when they arrive, there's no festival here. So they decide to get some sleep and say they will resume the search in the morning, when later that night... This is karma for abusing your treat, go Ash. Enjoy trying to rest now, biatch. So these guys set up the festival, and I gotta admit, this looks pretty cool. 
Also, something to note here, during the opening credits of this movie, there's no remix to the theme song that was in the anime at the time. Yeah, unlike the previous films, this one does something different. Nice. We also find out Butler and Diana part of the festival, and then we cut to the next day, where the festival is now in full swing. And how do we begin? By having our main cast playing with the attractions. It may not be that important in terms of the story, but it's still harmless fun, and it does have some decent comedic scenes with Brock and even Team Rocket. But after that, we then cut to Butler's magic show, where his first act is making Swablu's pop out of the hat and fly into the audience. <laughs> That's nothing. You should have seen his last act. How about a warm welcome for Hamos? So his next trick involves summoning a curly out of the hat, covering it in a sheet, setting it on fire, and then out pops... Diane? So wait, Pokemon could turn into humans? Pokedex, you have lied to us all! So while you adjust your snipers at me for that awful joke, a voice pops out of the CGI crystal and Max hears it. So Max decides to go up on stage, because he's SMRT, and him and Ash get to be volunteers in Butler's next trick. After that, Team Rocket decides to capture Pikachu, Curlia, and Butler's Mightyena, yet don't capture the Dusclops for some reason. And shock of all shocks, they get blasted out of the sky. Wow, that totally wasn't a waste of time. So after the show, Max asks Butler and Diane about the crystal, and they say it's Jirachi. Somehow, they don't really explain how they know it, but whatever, moves the plot along. They also state it appears every thousand years, and that in order to free Jirachi, he needs a friend chosen by destiny, and the Millennium Comet. Again, somehow. Was that like a scroll or cave drawing that stated the conditions of this or something? Because they seem to know a lot about Jirachi despite it only appearing every thousand years. So they decide to give the crystal to Max because he thinks he's the chosen friend, and they believe it's him because he heard a voice coming out of the crystal. Wow, these guys believe anything, don't they? I never know on the street who rambles about the apocalypse occurring, you probably tell them that Jiraji said that, and they'd probably believe it based on this shit. We then cut to later that night, where Ash's group is walking through the festival grounds, when May decides to purchase a wishing star, an item that can grant a wish when its panels are closed, but only when facing the comet, and only during the Millennium Comet. You know, there's a word out there for this kind of thing. It's called a scam, you dumb bitch. Seriously, would you trust this guy? He looks like the guy who'd hook you up with some China skitty rather than a legitimate product. Thankfully, May takes it without clearly paying this guy, and then we cut to the group chilling out next to a rock. We then get a scene where Max is clearly excited about becoming friends with Jirachi, before we finally get to see the comet for ourselves. And I gotta admit, this looks friggin' sweet. So May closes the first panel, and then Max falls asleep. Probably because the conversation before that point was about the future, and he was pretty much like, Fuck this shit, I'm out. Speaking of singing, though, May decides to sing him a lullaby. Oh, sorry, did I say sing? I mean say do, 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 for the scene. So Jirachi spawns from the crystal, and Diane lets him sleep in their bus for the evening. Meanwhile, Butler, after Diane informs him about Jirachi's awakening, decides to bring up his machines from underneath the stage. Over with our heroes, Max decides his first wish is to summon candy, and Jirachi does so, while also spawning crackers and potato chips. Was Max supposed to wish for junk food or something? Why would chips and crackers be in a candy wish? Also, we find out that Jirachi doesn't really create the candy, it just teleports it from the festival to here. Oh yeah, this is totally a powerful creature. He managed to do something an elegant lamb could do with ease. But joking aside, this is a cute scene. While I do have my complaints, I'd be lying if I said this scene didn't make me chuckle at points, and goddammit, Jirachi's expression makes it really hard for me to hate this scene. However, the result of this wish not only fills up the bus, but it also results in a weak joke. The one joke I do like is when after May chews out Max for that wish, Jirachi teleports her away. Don't get me wrong, I like May's character, but this is kind of funny. On to day two. We get some scenes of Max and Jirachi having fun together, and I like it. It's cute fun that doesn't overstay its welcome, unlike the fourth movie, and it also helps build the friendship the two are starting to develop. But this day doesn't end on a happy note, because an Absol appears and attacks Jirachi. For no reason. Sure, Absol can foretell upcoming disasters, but not only does it create destruction by attacking the area, but he doesn't attack the one who causes the disaster later on in the film, Butler, until after attacking Jirachi. So if we can sense where Jirachi is, why didn't he know where Butler was and attack him? Either way, it doesn't really matter because he captures Absol in a cage and then has Curly put it to sleep with Hypnosis. Now I would complain that a psychic type attack shouldn't do anything to a dark type, but even in the games, Hypnosis works on dark types even though it shouldn't, so screw it. If they don't care, why should I? So Butler kidnaps Jirachi late into the night, and we then get his backstory. Basically, this guy used to work for Team Magma, and he was trying to create a Groudon out of a fragment he claims to be from Groudon, and this results in it blowing up in his face, getting fired, and now he wants revenge. Well, at least we have a decent motivation for this guy, unlike the last movie. 
So back in the present day, he's still trying to create a Groudon, but this time he tries to use Jirachi's power to bring out Groudon from the fragment. Okay, question. Why can't Jirachi wish for a Groudon to appear? This film didn't give Jirachi much of a limit to its power, unlike other wish-granting creatures in fiction. So why can't Butler simply use his Dusclops to hypnotize Jirachi or something and have Butler's wish granted? Hey, this film failed to give this creature a limit, so why the hell not? Just saying, for a guy smart enough to make machines, this guy isn't using his noodle here. Speaking of which, he also didn't design his machines to be explosion proof because after his attempt to use Jirachi's power fails, the comet shoots back a beam at Jirachi, and Jirachi uses explosion. It's super effective. So why shouldn't the others find out that Jirachi was captured and arrive not too long after the explosion to save Jirachi? Then Diane decides to assist Ash's group after she realizes Butler is going too far, and they manage to get away, but Butler has his mighty Anna put a tracking device on the bus to track their location. So where are they going? To Jirachi's former home of Farina. And during this ride, they decide to go down the Exposition Express, because Diane exposits to May about a moment she had with Butler when they were children, and when Butler first started using magic. And to be honest, I like this scene. It explains a bit more about Diana and Butler's relationship, and it gives us a bit more character to Diana. And while I could argue that if they get Jirachi back to its home before Butler completes his plan, he will still be obsessed with revenge and try the other means of creating a ground on, I can't fault her hopes here. So after that scene, we got to a montage of them trying to get to Farina, and I like it. It has its humorous moments, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. We then got to the evening of night 5, where May points out that there are only two more nights, and Max gets pissy because he has to say goodbye to Jirachi soon. But after that, we get a nice scene with Ash and Max, where Ash talks about how Max and Jirachi will always be friends, and they'll always be in each other's heart, that kind of stuff. And then Ash talks about someone he was once friends with, and he admits he still misses her, which pretty much implies he's talking about Misty. And to be honest, that's really sweet that he still thinks of her even after all that time has passed. Huh? Oh, I just wanted to point out that this was a dub only line. The hell? I thought we were spirits! David, we share the same powers, giving life to inanimate objects. Did you really think that wouldn't apply to ghosts or spirits? Hell, I've been able to see them since I was a kid. Okay, so why are you talking to us now? Oh, I could hear you the whole time. I was just ignoring it up until this point. Anyways, I just wanted to point out that this was a dub only line. Wait, really? It wasn't in the Japanese version as well? Nope. Which kind of leads into a little rant, if you don't mind. Eh, floor is yours. Me. It. Just, just go ahead. Okay, then. Why not have this line be in the original version as well? Like it or not, the show follows the canon of the previous series, even if the characters don't really age. It still has Ash and Brock from the previous two shows in it, and it still continues their adventures. And even if a bunch of kids who started with Hoenn won't understand who Ash is referring to in this film, Older fans would. If we can have films that have stuff for the entire family to enjoy, why can't we have little nods and references to the old stuff in this film, or even the show? The speech is still good for kids, as it teaches them that friendships are still there, even after the person has moved away, so it's not like this mention is going to ruin it or anything. Plus, even back when this film came out, there were still fans of all ages watching the anime and playing the games. But what I'm ultimately getting at is this. Why does it have to be four kids to realize this? I know some people don't like four kids, and I will gladly admit that they have made a lot of mistakes, but you gotta give them credit on this one. Even they know that, at least in this movie, the people watching Pokemon aren't just kids. Okay, ran over. Go on with your little thing. Okay then. But unfortunately, we now cut to my least favorite part of this movie. The third act of this film. So after Ash and his group arrive in Farina, they stumble across the cave where Jirachi's crystal was, and are about to wish Jirachi goodbye, but Butler shows up and captures our heroes and Jirachi. Our heroes are able to free Jirachi eventually, but it's too late. During their time to escape and trying to free Jirachi, Butler used Jirachi's power to summon Groudon. Oh yes, this is gonna be awesome! This is gonna be a battle of effort proportion! What? 57 minutes of movie. Three acts. All the mentions. For this... thing? A creature that doesn't even have any of the cool abilities that the original has, and instead just sucks everything up with its tentacles, and kills the environment around it? This is seriously what they went with. You know what? Screw this. Just screw this. After a long chase, Butler decides to turn good after Diana gets absorbed, he helps Ash and Max reverse the polarity on the machine, they give Jirachi its power back, destroys the ground, and then Jirachi reverts back into a cocoon. Butler decides he and Diana are going to stay in Farina because they realize the only thing important to them now is each other, and the film ends. God damn it, that last act is shit. Anyways, as a story, it's not that bad. It didn't have that many problems in the first two acts, but my major issue is with the third act. All this build up for Groudon, for Butler's plan, was seriously this. I'm sorry, I can't get over that! 
This is a massive disappointment for me. It's like having a Fantastic Four movie with Galactus as the main villain, and after building him up, they decide to show him as a gigantic space cloud. They had a good thing going, and then they blew it! As for Butler's plan itself, yeah, it's kinda dumb. There were so many other ways he could've gone with his plan to revive Groudon, but he decides to use this machine? Why didn't he just wish for Jirachi to summon or create a Groudon? Why didn't he just wish for a blue orb and then ask Jirachi to take him to Groudon so that he can summon it? I'm not even saying that he should be able to control Groudon. If you want him to turn good, then maybe have the real one go out of control and have his abilities hurt the Pokemon and Diane. Then he could learn his lesson while everyone else is trying to find a way to stop it and then have him try to help Ash's group defeat slash destroy the Groudon and then you could still have the original ending. Does Butler plan completely ruin the story? No, but it is a flaw I still have with this film. Another flaw would be May's subplot with the Wishmaker. That plot point didn't really go anywhere. Frankly, it just made me wonder what the point of it was. But aside from that, I did like the friendship between Max and Jirachi. This film actually made me care about these two characters as friends, and it actually made me feel bad that Jirachi has to say goodbye. Sure, I wish the two got to know each other a lot better, but still, their scenes were some of my favorites in this film because it provided a lot of the good comedy and a lot of good moments, like Ash's speech about friendship. As for the characters themselves, they were mixed. I liked Diane, I liked Jirachi, I liked Max, Butler was okay even if his plan was dumb, Brock was forgettable as was May for the most part, and once again, Team Rocket was wasted in this film. Sure, they made appearances throughout the film, but I hardly mentioned them because they didn't really do much in those appearances. As for Absol, I do not get this character. The movie tries to say he wants to help Jirachi make it back home, but he attacks Jirachi on their first encounter. He also hardly does much throughout this film after that, and I almost forgot this character even existed until I went back to summarize the plot. As for the music, it's good. Sure, a couple of songs aren't that good, but that's only a small part, and the rest of the soundtrack is solid, especially that ending song. As for the animation, aside from the Groudon, which looks like shit, it's also solid. Not really much to complain about on that one. But I think it's time to wrap this up. Overall, this film is okay. Frankly, my biggest problem with this film is the final act. If that was fixed, then maybe I would call it a good or great movie. It would still have problems, but an argument could be made that those problems are minor at best. But to be fair, I would rather watch this film again than Pokemon Forever. So that concludes this review. I'm the Mountie, and next time we meet, I will welcome our sky-splitting visitor, in Destiny Deoxys. See you then. Okay, you're done. Now then, it's time to make your wish. You can have this reality. You can have this happy ending. You just need to say the words. <sighs> I refuse. Are you insane? You have this happy ending in front of you. You can have this happy life with your family. And you refuse it? Yes. Don't get me wrong. It hurts. It really hurt when it happened. I wish back then that it could be fixed, that it could be reversed. Hell, I thought I was responsible for what happened. But I grew up. I got help for that depression, for that guilt, and I got away from that bad situation. And now that I have, I've been given the chance to live my life to the fullest, to live a happy life. And now that I can enjoy life, why would I want to focus on that dark point? It happened, yes, but it's also in the past. I live in the present day, and while I can't alter the past, I can alter the future. Listen, if I want that happy ending, if I want to live out that happy life, I need to make that happen myself. If I make a wish for it, that's taking the lazy way out, and I refuse to do that. I worked hard to move past that incident, I will work hard to reach this goal. And my first goal before I wake up is to remove this problem. No, 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 please! I don't kill humans. But that rule doesn't apply to Pokemon, so unless you want to be erased, leave. <laughs> Ugh, Christ, that was a handful. But now it's time to get some sleep.